Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 60 of our podcast. Thank you for listening to this, our ultimate chapter. But while this tale may be coming to an end, we will be debuting a new story very soon, and we're incredibly excited about it. We'll be moving from the court of Elizabeth I to the creative world under James I. What happens if a lady in waiting wants to be on the stage to speak the speech? So please join us for our new story as we talk about history and entertain you with a tale that might have happened. We love speculation. Speculation is fun. And we're so fortunate to be sharing the end of this story with you. And we really look forward to sharing the new one. And help us continue. Support us. Buy some Tudor Time Machine swag. Yes, go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. Hit the Shop Now button. It's not super obvious. It's at the top of the page on the right. The two Tudor Time Machine swag is pretty great looking. You can get a Do You Tudor tee or a Tudor Time Machine logo sweatshirt, and you'll be supporting us at the same time, and we so appreciate it. In our last episode, we saw our Constance sail away to Sweden to the unknown. (laughs) But it's not quite over, because now we're going to go back to 1542 to see Margaret mourning the death of her brother Wyatt. And after the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 60, 1542, Hatfield House, in which Margaret sees the future of her brother's child. The children rode with such abandon, her son Henry Lee and Elizabeth, secret cousins, laughing, swatting at each other with spiny branches they had broken off a nearby yew. Margaret could not rate who was more daring. She felt giddy just as a witness. Her trance broke as Mistress Cat ran up the hill, calling out greetings. Lady Margaret Lee, oh me, oh my, my dear soul, how my heart breaks for you. Your brother was such a marvellous man. What a versifier. The angels embrace him now. Mistress Cat placed her hands on Margaret's cheeks. I thank you, said Margaret gently, turning away. She was selfish with her grief. She did not want to share remembrances with Mistress Cat, who had, in truth, never spoken a word to Thomas. What a handsome lad your Henry is, gushed Mistress Cat, the agony of the loss of Thomas Wyatt quite spent. Is nine not the perfect age? Light of heart, yet the mind so discerning. Lady Elizabeth knows far more than I do. How I admire her. Poor girl. Margaret shook herself, laughed, and waved at her son. They buried Thomas so quickly. Everyone feared a fever. A fever. So mundane for one such as her brother. He should have had a better end. One with panache. She hoped he was not disappointed. Looking down from heaven. Wishing he had died during a moonlit ride. Or making a grand stance. With her darling rascal brother gone, Lady Isabel Stoner would have no target for relentless suspicions. How that woman held on, Margaret thought. But Thomas never worried. He left that to her. He would tell her again and again that he kept Anne's words, her relic, as he called it, close to him always. That had made Margaret wild. But now she was grateful. Thomas's friend, Horsey, had apologized for the hurry to bury him, apologized for his clothes being burnt, apologized for the rush into a coffin. But Margaret was relieved. The relic, Anne's relic, was gone into oblivion in ashes or far beneath the ground. They are handsome together, their red hair and fine chins. See Lady Elizabeth leaning so far over her horse. What courage, Cat said. Margaret often wished Mistress Cat were a quieter sort of person. How well they look together, and they are good friends. Lady Elizabeth is fortunate. Her mother had such a friend as you, Lady Margaret. Cat pointed as Elizabeth jumped a high hedge. Look there. She is a wonder, but only you witness her. No one comes near. The king seems to forget her entirely. He has his own troubles, Margaret said, thinking Elizabeth safer, forgotten by such a monster. Your boy and my girl are such mates. They laugh. They are easy together. Could they not marry? That would be a fine thing. Margaret turned to her cheerful companion with a look of disbelief. These children? Secret cousins? How strange if they married. Of course, no one would pay any mind to the matchmaking of a governess. 
Sir Henry Lee would be a good match. Such a loquacious boy, Cat insisted. They are a sweet pair, Mistress Cat, yet they are but nine years old. Tis so, but my Lady Elizabeth, what will become of her? The king could marry a mermaid next, and we will be ruled by a fish. I worry that she will be put aside by the king for good. Once princess, now lady, the poor child is bound to fortune's wheel. As we all are, Mistress Cat. My lady Elizabeth is more bound than most. Some at court say she is not the king's daughter. Have you heard her sister, Princess Mary, say so? And she is not alone in such talk. It serves Mary nothing. The king has taken them both out of the royal line. Prince Edward will be king, and his children shall follow. Mary and Elizabeth will never reign. Tis so. Yet there are rats at Elizabeth's feet. The king seems to forget her in the midst of his troubles. Mistress Cat was not entirely without sense. A marriage, the right marriage, would help Elizabeth. Indeed, you and I will play marriage broker, Mistress Cat. We will find the right suitor for our Lady Elizabeth. None too high or too low. Mistress Cat settled down, full of observations about who would make a fine match. Love and fortune, and my mind remembered, of that that is now, and that that hath been. Margaret was drawn to those lines her brother had written. Her eyes filled with the sight of Thomas and Anne's daughter, a girl whom time would swallow up into silence. I just can't believe we've come to the end of our story. This last chapter of this tale had us thinking about so many things. We imagine that Thomas and Margaret had one of those special close brother-sister relationships. And by all historical accounts, he was an amazing person. So if they had had this close relationship, it just would have been a huge loss to her when he passed. And it was pretty sudden. King Henry had sent Wyatt on a diplomatic mission, and he came down with a terrible fever. And he made it to a friend's house in Dorset, but he died there in 1542. His body was not taken back to Kent, which was, as we've talked about, the ancestral home of the Wyatts. He was buried at Sherborne Abbey, and they might have buried him quickly because of this fever. We don't really know why his body wasn't taken back to his home. At least Sherborne is a very beautiful town. And according to all the travel brochures, it is the most beautiful town in England. <laughs> of course, we've read that about other most beautiful towns and we think they're all beautiful <laughs> we do we think they are all beautiful mm -hmm. we still feel sorry for margaret because she loses her brother yes but also when she dies she doesn't even get a record of her death at least not one that we can find it must have been some time before 1548 because in that year her husband anthony married someone else <laughs> <laughs> Anne hassel it doesn't seem like the Wyatt siblings were lucky in love because when Anthony married his former mistress, Anne Hassel, he had already had two sons by her and sons who were clearly born when Margaret was still alive. Poor Margaret. Her husband's running around and having sons by another woman. He did. And he had those two sons legitimized after her death. He's a bit the opposite of Henry. He was good at getting sons, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> and in this closing moment of our story in 1542, Margaret is also watching her son by him. And his name is Sir Henry Lee. And he's playing with the young Elizabeth. Who was not even referred to as Princess Elizabeth at this point. She was simply Lady Elizabeth. No one knew quite what to call her. Henry had taken both her and Mary out of the line of succession. Mary and Elizabeth's positions in the succession is extremely confusing. Yes, because it was constantly shifting. One was in line, one was out of line. Then they were both out and then they were both in again. Henry passed three different succession acts from 1533 to 1543. And with each one, he said, this is the final <laughs> act of succession. This is my <laughs> final and true and real wife until yes. I get rid of her. And with each one, he made speaking against the act treason, even though each act contradicted all the previous acts. You mean Henry's policy were a shifting hot mess? Shocking. In the first act, called the Succession to the Crown Act of 1533, he declared Anne Boleyn his only legal wife. Because Catherine of Aragon was still alive at this point, 
and it declared his daughter Mary a bastard. That's nice. Nothing but class. <laughs> it said that Princess Elizabeth was the heir presumptive to the crown and that any children of Anne Boleyn's will be in line to the throne. So then in 1536, after the execution of Anne, Henry passed the succession to the crown, Marriage Act of 1536. Henry was clearly in a very bad temper when he made this one. The act covered a lot. Firstly, that now both of his former marriages were invalid and that both Mary and Elizabeth were bastards. This act was passed after Henry's marriage to Jane Seymour, but before Edward VI was born. The act said that Henry himself could name his heir in his last will. Right. That person had to have a reasonable claim, of course. If Henry had dropped dead in 1536 without naming anyone, the crown might have gone to our own Margaret Douglas, Countess of Lennox, daughter of Henry's sister, Margaret Tudor, because both Mary and Elizabeth were out. Yeah, that's interesting to think about. That's a fun historical what if. What if Margaret Douglas, daughter of Margaret Tudor, had been the first Queen of England? Or what about Henry's illegitimate son, Fitzroy? Maybe he would have been named. Mm, the timing is a bit off for Fitzroy because Anne was executed on May 19th. Henry married Jane on May 30th. The second act was issued in June. And Fitzroy was dead by July, probably from tuberculosis. Fitzroy was probably already very ill by the time this act was passed. And probably Henry knew that he wasn't going to make it. The spring and summer of 1536 was an incredibly turbulent time. I'll say. But this act of 1536 also made it treason to question the act itself hmm. and to refer to Henry's former marriages as valid. I couldn't say Queen Catherine introduced me to that Spanish person. I wonder how you were supposed to refer to these two people who had once been queens, but now were unmentionable. Maybe you were supposed to refer to Anne Boleyn as she who could not be named. <laughs> in this act in 1536, for good measure, Henry also threw in that it was treason to criticize the execution of Sir Thomas More. Henry did not like to be criticized. It says a lot that he felt the need to address that criticism and address it legally because Thomas More had been dead a year before this act was passed. So there, there must have still been a lot of disquiet and upset over his death for Henry to feel so threatened that he had to say it was treason to mention it. Henry was pretty thin skinned. So in 1543, he passed a third act of succession. This act put Mary and Elizabeth back in the line of succession, after Edward, of course, and after Edward's children, and after any children Henry might have with Catherine Parr. Or any future wives. They were still considered, and this is a strange one, bastards. Which is a very weird situation. You're in the line, but you're illegitimate. Henry wanted to have it both ways. He wanted them to be in line, but he certainly did not want to have to say that his marriages to Catherine and Anne had been valid. And I think he was assuming, well, I mean, he was hoping and praying that Edward would have his own children and that it would never even get to either of his daughters. I've often read that it was Catherine Parr who convinced Henry to put them back in the line of succession, but that must have been a very delicate conversation to have with him, considering that the second act of succession made it high treason to even question them being out of line. Right. And Henry was such a loose cannon. It would have been terrifying to bring anything up with him if you were unsure that you were committing treason by saying something. Maybe it was Catherine Parr. Maybe she did it in a very, very careful way. Or who knows, maybe Henry, who was in very terrible shape by this time, realized that he probably would not father any more children and he wanted his blood on the throne. So he was going to include all his children just in case. 
Also, putting Mary and Elizabeth back in the line of succession made them more valuable on the European marriage market, because even if he wasn't willing to legitimize them, the fact that they were being included in that line sort of gave them some clout. That's true. And I feel like that's the kind of motivation a man like Henry would really go for. Mm -hmm. Their worth in political marriages. Sure, because that's how princesses were seen at this point. And in his will, Henry made it illegal for them to marry without the consent of his privy council. So that one worked for Elizabeth in the long run. (laughs) Once she was queen, she used that law in order to prolong marriage negotiations that she was entangled in. She was good at that. It's not my fault. It's my counselors. They will not let me do it. When our Margaret Wyatt gazes at little Elizabeth, she cannot conceive that Elizabeth could ever be queen. Mm -hmm. It's unthinkable. Elizabeth is bastardized out of the succession and she's not even welcome at court. Edward was only four years younger than Elizabeth and he's male, which of course puts him in the front of the line anyway. And while Henry is a human disaster, he might still maybe produce another heir And certainly you could never say out loud that you didn't think he would, because I'm sure that was also treason. Henry has to not produce an heir. Edward has to not produce an heir. And Mary has to not produce an heir. In order for Elizabeth to be queen. Yes. And in 1542, the court is reeling from the execution of poor young Catherine Howard. And Lady Elizabeth and her nurse, Kate Champernow, who we really usually read as Cat Ashby, are very far away from court at Hatfield House. Cat Ashby was such a huge part of Elizabeth's life. And she served Elizabeth until her own death in 1565. She served her through thick and thin. She really there were did. a lot of incidents. Yeah, yeah, for all the ups and downs of Elizabeth's early years, Cat was right there with her. And then when she went to court and she became queen, she stayed with her and served her. It's amazing because Elizabeth, unlike her father, was incredibly loyal to people. I think she even said something to the effect of we make our own families, that the people who brought you up and were loyal to you became your family. She definitely stuck with people. There are records that when her longtime advisor, William Cecil, was on his deathbed, she sat with him and fed him herself with a little spoon. (laughs) And for someone like Elizabeth, that really shows something about her. It's so human and personal. Honestly, just the fact that William Cecil was with her from the beginning and that he lived and died as someone who was still in her council. And it's the opposite of Henry because being close to Henry was dangerous because he really did turn on the people who were closest to him. Elizabeth was very gifted at keeping a variety of factions in her court, listening to all sides and keeping it interesting and not just executing people who did something that she didn't like. Henry was not a negotiator and he was not gifted at relationships. He did not have that gift. <laughs> no. He married Catherine Parr, his sixth wife, in July 1543. And that's really when we see things begin to look up for Elizabeth, because Catherine Parr worked to bring both Mary and Elizabeth back to court. And I'm not sure exactly when Elizabeth's title as a princess was restored. I'm not either, but it might have been something that happened after this third act of succession. And maybe Mary got her title back at the same time. And I believe that at this point, Catherine Parr took over Elizabeth's education, which was certainly incredibly important in Elizabeth's life because Catherine Parr was so well-educated and also because Catherine Parr had very Protestant reformist views and she certainly chose people to educate Elizabeth who shared those views. And in fact, Elizabeth continued to study with her even after the death of her Mm -hmm. father. And Henry died in January of 1547. And he had a will, and it said, as to the succession of the crown, it shall go to Prince Edward and the heirs of his body, in default to Henry's children by his present wife, Queen Catherine, or any future wife. He wasn't closing the door. (laughs) That must have made Catherine Parr feel very secure. (laughs) In default 
to his daughter Mary and the heirs of her body Mm -hmm. upon condition that she shall not marry without the written and sealed consent of a majority of the surviving members of the Privy Council appointed by him to his son, Prince Edward, in default to his daughter Elizabeth upon like condition, in default to the heirs of the body of Lady Frances, eldest daughter of his late sister, the French queen, in default to those of Lady Eleanor, second daughter of the said French queen, and in default to his right heirs, either Mary or Elizabeth, failing to observe the conditions aforesaid, shall forfeit all right to the succession. What does the phrase default to his right heirs? That's also a very wide open statement. It's a little condemnation of them there at the end, I feel like. If they fail to observe the conditions aforesaid, a lawyerly person could do something with that if they wanted to get away. It's sort of reiterating this. They're sort of the last of my choices. I don't know. It's interesting, actually, because the children of Margaret Tudor, who was Henry's elder sister, actually, technically, should those children should have been before Mary Tudor, Henry's younger sister. They're totally out of the succession. He doesn't put the heirs of her body at all. Margaret's only surviving child, Margaret Douglas, plotter extraordinaire, (laughs) she's out. But all the Gray sisters are in, Jane, Catherine, and Mary, which is maybe not for the best. Also, someone we don't hear too much about, which is Margaret Clifford, who was Mary Tudor's other daughter's, Eleanor's daughter. So she's fifth in line according to Henry's last will and testament at this time. I'm sure Henry hoped his horror of having an English queen would be avoided, even though there are so many women named in his last will and testament. Beyond Edward, there isn't anybody else who's male. No, it's extraordinary. I wonder what he thought of that. No, after all his beer and all his desire to have these male children and this act of succession and his last will with all these women's names, they have staying power after Henry's dead and they cause a lot of friction and upheaval. And They do. And those acts of succession, they also really contributed to the confusion because while Edward inherited the throne, most straightforward way, when he died, it was chaotic. Yeah, it was chaotic. And Henry contributed to that. He'd gone back and forth so much about Elizabeth and Mary being in line. And he had mentioned his sister, Mary Tudor's grandchildren. Lady Jane Grey was the eldest. So Edward had very good, quote unquote, legal reasons for skipping over Mary and Elizabeth and just going straight to Lady Jane Grey. Because Henry also introduced the idea that the king could choose the successor. That's right. And we don't know if Edward was manipulated by his Lord Protector, John Dudley, who was the father of Elizabeth's favorite, Robert Dudley. Yeah, the generations continue, right? But the question that a lot of historians wrangle with is, did John Dudley manipulate Edward into choosing Lady Jane Grey? Or did Edward himself admire Lady Jane Grey's Protestant sympathies or some of both? It's really hard to know exactly how it happened, but he did want Lady Jane Grey to be his heir. And he excluded both Mary and Elizabeth, citing this idea that they were both illegitimate. But Dudley knew Mary would be a problem. She's in her 30s. She's been around. She knows. She's been waiting a long time. And he invites her to the castle to see Edward as he's ill. And of course, he intends to arrest her and imprison her. But she did not go. No, she knew the craziness of the Tudor court. She had lived it. And we hear a lot about how Elizabeth survived, but so did Mary. And Mary was brave too, because she had opportunities to leave England and go to Spain to be with her mother's family. And she resisted those offers as much as it must have been tempting for her just to get out of England, go to a Protestant country. She had a very strong sense of her own right to, to be queen. Even though Dudley tried to get rid of Mary, he just didn't have the political savvy or the will of the people 
people to make the choice of Lady Jane Grey seem stronger than Mary's claim. No, Mary was first in line to the throne as the eldest of Henry VIII. And she had, and Catherine, her mother, had been popular. And she had been firstborn princess for a while before she was cast aside. So Mm -hmm. people knew her. And Dudley was extremely extremely unpopular seen as a social climber, manipulative. He couldn't make a coalition. So Mary was England's first queen against all odds, but it was a very brief reign, only five years. She made a wildly unpopular marriage to Philip of Spain. And obviously she didn't have children. She wanted to produce an heir to the throne, something that this whole group of people were unable to do. Elizabeth didn't Um, even try. (laughs) Elizabeth was like, I'm just not going in there. (laughs) But when that just did not seem possible for her, she, like those before her, thought, well, maybe I'll just change the line of succession. So she considered maybe I'll just give it to Margaret Douglas, who was a Catholic and had a strong claim. We don't know if she was persuaded by her husband or others or whether she wanted to follow the order of her father. I mean, she was in some ways a very strong traditionalist. So I don't know, but she did name Elizabeth as her heir. It's interesting though, because you see why Margaret Douglas Countess of Lennox continued to plot and scheme because she had come so close to being queen. And I'm sure she felt that her claim was very, very good. She was Henry's elder sister's child. No one could have imagined that Elizabeth would become queen and that the crown would pass this way and that it would end up on Elizabeth's head. But lo and behold, in 1558, it did. The result was very good for England. I mean, Elizabeth was a ruler of extraordinary ability. She chose good advisors. She stabilized the country. She increased literacy. No ruler is perfect. There certainly Elizabeth was not, but she was pretty farsighted and she did help bring England up to be a powerful force on the world stage. She had such a long reign and she was really able to move things because she had longevity and she had a very stable team around her. She was able to keep it all going. Yes. And I've read some people who say, well, Elizabeth was only, is only considered a great queen because she had such good advisors who really kept her on the good course. And they were really the reason why her government was effective. But I also think that's kind of a weird reading of that scenario, because the ability to choose people who are good at their jobs and to stick with them and not question their choices or to delegate responsibility to people who are competent. I think that's actually one of the best qualities of a leader. I agree. You know, and if I don't you... think that means that you're not a good leader, that you're a good leader by default because you surround yourself with good people. But knowing how to surround yourself with good people is part of what makes being a good leader. And we know that some of Henry's strongest advisors, Thomas Cromwell, who obviously is a man you could say many negative things about, but he was a strong advisor to Henry, and obviously Henry killed him. Even Thomas Gresham. Thomas Gresham started suggesting that the way the economy was running was a problem. And Henry did not listen to him. And Elizabeth did. She did make it happen. And you can, of course, argue there were other things, timing, this and that. But nonetheless, having the good people, being able to listen to them and make it happen. I mean, what what is a greater leader than that? You, that is good leadership. <laughs> no, I agree. That doesn't seem to me to be something that makes Elizabeth a lesser queen. She was able to weigh things. And the fact is, there's no way as a leader of a whole country, you can have perfect understanding of the Navy, of the economics, of the schooling system, of the wool trade. You must delegate and you must be able to balance it. And that is what she had. And that is also greatness. No, I agree. She always had her own mind. And when she was dying, Elizabeth ignored her father's will, because according to what his will said on her death, the crown would go to Anne Stanley, Eleanor's daughter. But Elizabeth wanted it to go to James VI of Scotland. And unlike when her younger brother Edward tried it, that is who succeeded her and people respected her wishes. She knew that Robert Cecil, Cecil's son, had made a lot of overtures to James, that they were sort of setting him up to come in. 
and that James was a little enigmatic about his religious beliefs because a lot of Catholics thought because he was Mary Queen of Scots' son, he would come back and be very sympathetic to Catholics and Protestants knew he had been brought up as a Protestant. He could be anticipated in different ways. She loved to keep people guessing and she felt like he had that quality that Mm -hmm. you didn't know exactly where he stood. I really believe people listen to her, particularly on this, the question of succession, because they must have really resonated with her, Mm -hmm. whether they liked her or didn't like her, put herself out there as England. And I think she really succeeded in creating that kind of connection with her people. Let's be honest, you know, even though Elizabeth was such a successful queen and she was on the throne for 44 years, people still would have preferred a male to take the throne after her than a female. And a man who had already produced children who would then make the next line of succession clear. So I'm sure there were some other things going on there too. It's been so great for us to imagine these characters living in Elizabeth's world and to do all this research and learn so much and learn what we don't know. (laughs) Also, what questions we can't answer. And it's been amazing sharing this story with you. And we can't wait to start with the next one and to start this new vista of research and find out all kinds of things that we can share with you and to tell you a new story. We can't wait to start it. This has been so wonderful and I hope you all have really enjoyed it and also that you can love history, not have to be a historian. (laughs) Yeah. So I totally support that. I hope all of you non-historians, I give you guys a special send out because (laughs) it's fun just to be interested in things as well. And I feel like I've learned so much about everything doing this research. And I hope that we've been able to share that with you. Oh, it's been great. And we can't wait to take you on another Tudor Stewart journey. (laughs) Yes, but we're still the Tudor time machine. (laughs) We're Tudor time machine. Thank you to all our listeners who've been on this journey with us. Join us next time for more Tudor-minded talk. (laughs) 